From off a hill whose concave womb reworded A plaintful story from a sistering veil, My spirits to attend this double voice accorded, And down I laid to list the sad tune tale. Ere long espied a fickle maid full pale, Tearing of papers, breaking rings a twain, Storming her world with sorrow's wind and rain. A Lover's Complaint by William Shakespeare is a narrative poem about a young woman, abandoned by her lover, who pours out her emotions in a monologue of despair and disillusionment. The poem explores themes of love, betrayal, and loss, portraying the woman's pain and the harsh reality of romantic relationships when they are not reciprocated. This excerpt from Shakespeare's A Lover's Complaint presents a scene where the speaker from a hilltop observes a distressed young woman in the valley below who seems to be going through a heartbreak. This woman is depicted as tearing up letters and breaking rings, symbols of love and commitment, suggesting the end of a romantic relationship. The storm of sorrows, wind, and rain metaphorically represents her emotional turmoil and devastation. Upon her head, a plaited hive of straw, which fortified her visage from the sun, whereon the thought might think sometime it saw the carcass of beauty spent and done. Time had not scythed all that youth begun, nor youth all quit, but spite of heaven's fell rage, some beauty peeped through lattice of seared age. In these lines, Shakespeare uses vivid imagery to describe a woman who has aged, yet still retains some of her former beauty. The plaited hive of straw on her head could refer to her hair, now pale and straw-like with age, while her face is protected, or fortified, from the sun's harsh rays. Despite the passage of time represented by the scythed youth and the carcass of beauty spent and done, there are hints of her past beauty that still manage to shine through the lattice of seared age, suggesting that beauty persists despite the ravages of time and age. Oft did she heave her napkin to her eyne, which on it had conceited characters, laundering the silken figures in the brine, that seasoned woe had pelleted in tears, and often reading what contents it bears, as often shrieking undistinguished woe, in clamors of all size, both high and low. The woman in the poem frequently lifts her handkerchief, stained with tears to her eyes. These tears, a result of her seasoned sorrow, seem to create figures or characters on the fabric, which she often reads as if they bear messages of her grief. She frequently expresses her indistinguishable sorrow through loud and soft cries. Sometimes her leveled eyes their carriage ride, as they did battery to the spheres intend. Sometimes diverted their poor balls are tied to the orbed earth. Sometimes they do extend their view right on. Anon their gazes lend to every place at once, and nowhere fixed, the mind and sight distractedly commixed. This excerpt describes the erratic and unfocused gaze of the subject, likely a woman in a state of emotional turmoil. The lines convey the idea that her eyes, and by extension her attention and thoughts, are constantly shifting, never settling on one thing for long. This could imply a state of confusion, distraction, or indecisiveness, reflecting her emotional instability. Her hair, nor loose nor tied in formal plait, proclaimed in her a careless hand of pride. For some untucked, descended her sheathed hat, hanging her pale and pined cheek beside. Some in her threatened fillet still did bide, and true to bondage would not break from thence, though slackly braided in loose negligence. These lines portray the woman's hair as untamed and disorderly, reflecting her nonchalant pride and indifference. The strands that hang loosely by her pale, thin cheek symbolize her melancholic state, while those remaining in her threatened fillet represent her enduring loyalty, even amidst the chaos and neglect. A thousand favors from a mon she drew, of amber, crystal, and of beaded jet, which one by one she in a river threw, upon whose weeping margent she was set, like usury applying wet to wet, or monarch's hands that let not bounty fall, where want cries some, but where excess begs all. Shakespeare uses vivid imagery to describe a woman who is discarding precious items into a river, symbolizing the release of her past loves or experiences. The reference to usury and monarch's hands suggests her generosity or love was exploited or not reciprocated, leading to emotional excess, 
hence she discards them to restore balance. The last line implies that her love was not valued where it was needed, but was instead taken for granted where it was abundant. Of folded schedules had she many a one, which she perused, sighed, tore, and gave the flood, cracked many a ring of posied gold and bone, bidding them find their sepulchres in mud, found yet mo letters sadly penned in blood, with slighted silk feet and affectedly, and swathed, and sealed to curious secrecy. The lines depict a woman who is overwhelmed by numerous love letters, folded schedules, which she reads with a sigh, tears up, and throws into the water. She also breaks many ornately decorated rings of gold and bone, symbolizing ended relationships, and discards them into the mud. She discovers even more letters, written in blood for dramatic effect, wrapped in silk and sealed, indicating secret, perhaps forbidden, love affairs. These often bathed she in her fluxive eyes, and often kissed, and often gan to tear. Cried, O false blood, thou register of lies, what unapproved witness dost thou bear? Ink would have seemed more black and damned here. This said, in top of rage, the lines she rents, big discontent so breaking their contents. The female protagonist is depicted as emotionally overwhelmed, often crying over and kissing a letter, presumably from a deceitful lover. She expresses her anger and betrayal, accusing the letter, referred to as false blood, of bearing false testimony. She wishes the lies were written in black ink to reflect the darkness and damnation of the deceit. In her rage, she tears the letter apart, symbolizing her discontent and the destruction of the relationship it represents. A reverend man that grazed his cattle nigh, sometime a blusterer that the ruffle knew of court of city and had let go by, the swiftest hours observed as they flew, towards this afflicted fancy fastly drew, and privileged by age, desires to know, in brief, the grounds and motives of her woe. The lines describe an elderly man, who is both a pastoral figure and someone familiar with the complexities of court and city life. He notices the afflicted fancy or the troubled state of the subject, and using his privilege as an older, wiser individual, he wishes to understand the reasons and motivations behind her sorrow. So slides he down upon his grain bat, and comely distant sits he by her side. When he again desires her, being sat, her grievance with his hearing to divide, if that from him there may be aught applied, which may her suffering ecstasy assuage, tis promised in the charity of age. Shakespeare illustrates a scene where a man tries to comfort a woman, sitting at a respectable distance, and listens to her grievances. His intention is to alleviate her emotional suffering, if there's any way he can, as it's a promise he's made due to his maturity and compassion. Father, she says, though in me you behold the injury of many a blasting hour, let it not tell your judgment I am old, not age but sorrow, over me hath power, I might as yet have been a spreading flower, fresh to myself if I had self-applied, love to myself and to no love beside. The woman is pleading, expressing that her worn and aged appearance is not due to the natural passage of time, but rather the emotional toll of her sorrows and heartbreaks. She regrets not having loved and taken care of herself more, suggesting that she might have remained vibrant and youthful, like a blooming flower, if she had not given her love to unworthy individuals. But woe is me, too early I attended, a youthful suit it was to gain my grace of one by nature's outward so commended, that maiden's eyes stuck over all his face, love lacked a dwelling and made him her place. And when in his fair parts she did abide, she was new lodged and newly deified. The speaker is expressing regret over falling too soon for a young suitor who was physically attractive, captivating the attention of many young women. The speaker suggests that love, personified, had no home until it found one in this attractive man and once love took residence in him, it was as if he was elevated to a divine status. His browny locks did hang in crooked curls, and every light occasion of the wind upon his lips their silken parcels hurls. What sweet to do to do will aptly find. Each eye that saw him did enchant the mind, for on his visage was in little drawn 
what largeness thinks in paradise was sawn. This excerpt describes a man of captivating beauty and charm. His curly brown hair sways with the wind, his lips are enticing, and his face is so expressive and attractive that it seems to contain a world of emotions and thoughts, resembling the vastness and beauty of paradise. His allure is such that anyone who sees him is immediately enchanted, finding pleasure in his presence. Small show of man was yet upon his chin. His phoenix down began but to appear, like unshorn velvet on that termless skin whose bare outbragged the web it seemed to wear, yet showed his visage by that cost more dear. And nice affections wavering stood in doubt, if best were as it was, or best without. These lines describe a young man on the cusp of maturity, his facial hair just beginning to grow, compared to the softness of unshorn velvet. The poet expresses uncertainty as to whether his face is more appealing with or without the presence of this new growth indicating a struggle to accept the inevitable transformation from youth to adulthood. His qualities were beauteous as his form, for maiden-tongued he was, and thereof free. Yet, if men moved him, was he such a storm as oft twixt May and April is to see, when winds breathe sweet, unruly though they be. His rudeness so with his authorized youth did livery falseness in a pride of truth. This passage describes a man of both physical beauty and eloquent speech, who is generally calm but can become tempestuous if provoked, much like the unpredictable weather in spring. His youthful confidence and charm often mask his insincere or deceitful behavior, presenting it instead as honesty and pride. Well, could he ride, and often men would say, that horse his mettle from his rider takes, proud of subjection, noble by the sway, what rounds, what bounds, what course, what stop he makes. And controversy hence a question takes, whether the horse by him became his deed, or he his manage by the well-doing steed. Shakespeare describes a skilled horseman whose abilities are so impressive, they inspire debate about whether the horse's excellence is a result of the rider's skill, or if the rider's reputation is enhanced by the horse's performance. The horse is described as proud and noble under the rider's control, and the precise movements it makes are a testament to either the rider's command or the horse's innate ability. The lines explore the symbiotic relationship between the horse and the rider, questioning who truly deserves the credit for their shared accomplishment. But quickly on this side the verdict went. His real habitude gave life and grace to appertainings and to ornament accomplished in himself, not in his case. All aids, themselves made fairer by their place, came for additions, yet their purpose trim, pieced not his grace, but were all graced by him. This excerpt speaks to the inherent charm and grace of the man in question. His natural demeanor and personality enhance his physical adornments and accessories, rather than the other way around. The man's personal attributes are so compelling that even though others might try to enhance their own appearances, they cannot match his innate elegance. So on the tip of his subduing tongue, all kinds of arguments and question deep, all replication prompt and reason strong, for his advantage still did wake and sleep. To make the weeper laugh, the laugher weep, he had the dialect and different skill, catching all passions in his craft of will. These lines depict the persuasive and manipulative nature of the speaker's lover. His eloquence and ability to argue any point, combined with his emotional intelligence, allow him to manipulate others' feelings for his own benefit. He is so skilled in his craft of manipulation that he can make someone crying laugh and someone laughing cry. That he did in the general bosom reign of young, of old, and sexes both enchanted to dwell with him in thoughts or to remain in personal duty following where he haunted, consents bewitched ere he desire have granted, and dialogued for him what he would say, asked their own wills, and made their wills obey. These lines describe a charismatic character who is universally admired and adored by all, regardless of age or gender. The character has such a strong influence that people are bewitched into agreeing with him even before he expresses his desires. 
It's as if they can anticipate his wants and are so enamored that they willingly submit their own wills to his. Many there were that did his picture get, to serve their eyes and in it put their mind, like fools that in imagination set the goodly objects which abroad they find of lands and mansions, theirs in thought assigned, and laboring in mo pleasures to bestow them than the true gouty landlord which doth owe them. These lines describe the infatuation of many with the subject's image, using it to fuel their fantasies, much like dreamers who imagine themselves owners of beautiful lands and mansions they've only seen. However, these dreamers invest more emotional labor in these imagined pleasures than the actual owners who are burdened by the realities of ownership, symbolized by the gouty landlord. So many have that never touched his hand, sweetly supposed them mistress of his heart. My woeful self that did in freedom stand, and was my own fee simple, not in part. What with his art in youth and youth in art, through my affections in his charmed power, reserved the stock and gave him all my flower. The speaker is expressing regret over having given her love and affection to a man who had many admirers, none of whom he truly loved. She laments that she had been independent and fully in control of herself, but was beguiled by his youthful charm and artful seduction. She metaphorically states that she reserved her core self, but gave him all her beauty and love, which she now regrets. Yet did I not, as some my equals did, demand of him, nor being desired yielded, finding myself in honor so forbid, with safest distance I mine honor shielded. Experience for me many bulwarks builded, of proofs new bleeding, which remained the foil of this false jewel and his amorous spoil. The speaker in these lines is expressing a sense of self-protection and restraint in love. Despite feeling the allure of love, the speaker did not succumb to their lover's desires as others might have, instead choosing to uphold their honor and dignity. The speaker has learned from past experiences which serve as a protective barrier against the deceitful allure of this false lover. But ah, whoever shunned by precedent, the destined ill she must herself assay, or forced examples gainst her own content to put the bypassed perils in her way. Counsel may stop a while what will not stay, for when we rage advice is often seen by blunting us to make our wits more keen. These lines reflect on the inevitability of experiencing personal hardship despite warnings from others or past experiences. The speaker suggests that advice can temporarily deter us, but in our passionate states, it often only serves to sharpen our determination to pursue our desires, even if they lead to peril. Nor gives it satisfaction to our blood that we must curb it upon others' proof to be forbod the sweets that seem so good for fear of harms that preach in our behoof. O appetite, from judgment stand aloof, the one a palate hath that needs will taste, though reason weep and cry, it is thy last. These lines depict the struggle between desire and reason. The speaker is lamenting the need to suppress their own desires based on others' experiences and warnings, and the frustration of being denied pleasures that appear enticing. The final lines highlight the conflict between instinctive appetite and rational judgment, where the former often prevails despite the latter's desperate pleas for restraint. For further I could say this man's untrue, and knew the patterns of his foul beguiling, heard where his plants in others' orchards grew, saw how deceits were gilded in his smiling, knew vows were ever brokers to defiling thought characters and words merely but art, and bastards of his foul, adulterate heart. This excerpt describes the speaker's awareness of a man's deceitful nature. The speaker is well acquainted with the man's methods of deception, such as his insincere vows and charming smiles that hide his true intentions. The speaker also perceives his flattering words as mere artifice, the illegitimate offspring of his deceitful heart. And long upon these terms I held my city, Till thus he gan besiege me, gentle maid, have of my suffering youth some feeling pity, and be not of my holy vows afraid, that's to ye sworn to none was ever said, for feasts of love I have been called unto, till now did ne'er invite, 
nor never woo. In these lines, the speaker describes how they maintained their emotional independence until a suitor began to pursue them, pleading for sympathy due to his youthful suffering. The suitor assures the speaker that his promises of love are genuine and unique, and although he has been invited to partake in romantic endeavors before, he has never actively sought out or desired such experiences until now. All my offenses that abroad you see are errors of the blood, none of the mind. Love made them not, with acture they may be, where neither party is nor true nor kind. They sought their shame that so their shame did find, and so much less of shame in me remains, by how much of me their reproach contains. In these lines, the speaker is expressing remorse, acknowledging that their actions which are visible to others are mistakes driven by passion, not by rational thought. They assert that these actions weren't born out of love, but rather from situations where neither honesty nor kindness was present. The speaker suggests that those who sought to shame them have only found their own disgrace, reducing the speaker's sense of shame. This reduction is directly proportional to the amount of their own disgrace that they project onto the speaker. Among the many that mine eyes have seen, not one whose flame my heart so much has warmed, or my affection put to the smallest team, or any of my leisures ever charmed. Harm have I done to them, but near was harmed, kept hearts in liveries, but mine own was free and reigned, commanding in his monarchy. The speaker in these lines is expressing that out of all the potential lovers they have encountered, none have truly stirred their heart or attracted their affection. Despite causing emotional harm to others, they themselves have remained unscathed and free maintaining control over their own emotions and desires. Look here what tributes wounded fancies sent me, of paled pearls and rubies red as blood, figuring that they their passions likewise lent me, of grief and blushes aptly understood, in bloodless white and the encrimsoned mood, effects of terror and dear modesty, encamped in hearts but fighting outwardly. These lines describe the speaker receiving gifts of pearls and rubies from admirers, symbols of their emotions. The white pearls represent grief, while the red rubies symbolize blushes of modesty and love. These gifts are seen as the physical manifestations of the internal struggle these admirers are experiencing, a battle between fear and modest affection. And, lo behold these talents of their hair, with twisted metal amorously impleached, I have received from many a several fair, their kind acceptance weepingly beseeched, with the annexions of fair gems enriched, and deep brain sonnets that did amplify each stone's dear nature, worth and quality. This passage describes the speaker receiving gifts from various lovers, gifts that include locks of hair intertwined with metal, precious gems, and deeply thoughtful sonnets. These gifts are given with emotional pleas for acceptance, and each one is seen as a testament to the giver's affection, their intrinsic value amplified by the accompanying poems. The diamond, why, t'was beautiful and hard, whereto his invised properties did tend, the deep green emerald in whose fresh regard weak sights their sickly radiance do amend, the heaven-hued sapphire and the opal blend with objects manifold, each several stone, with wit well blazoned, smiled or made some moan. This passage from A Lover's Complaint uses gemstones as a metaphor for the different facets of love and human emotion. The diamond represents beauty and resilience. The emerald symbolizes rejuvenation and healing, and the sapphire and opal represent the vastness and complexity of feelings. Each stone, with its unique properties, reflects a different emotional state, whether it's joy, smiling, or sorrow, moaning. Lo, all these trophies of affections hot, of pensived and subdued desires the tender, nature hath charged me that I hoard them not, but yield them up where I myself must render. That is, to you my origin and ender. For these of force must your oblations be, since I their alter you and patron me. In these lines, the speaker expresses their intense emotions and desires, which they've held on to like trophies. They feel compelled by nature to surrender these emotions to the person they love, describing that person as their beginning and end, 
They see themselves as an altar where the loved one must offer these emotions, indicating a deep sense of devotion and submission to this love. O oh, then, advance of yours that phraseless hand whose white weighs down the airy scale of praise. Take all these similes to your own command, hallowed with sighs that burning lungs did raise. What me, your minister, for you obeys, works under you, and to your audit comes, their distract parcels in combined sums. The speaker in these lines is imploring their lover to accept their expressions of love, symbolized through the similes and sighs. They acknowledge the lover's superiority and purity, whose white weighs down the airy scale of praise, and offers themselves up as a servant. What me, your minister, for you obeys. The final lines suggest a sense of surrender as the speaker submits their chaotic, fragmented feelings, their distract parcels, to the lover's judgment and authority, to your audit comes. Lo, this device was sent me from a nun, or sister sanctified, of holiest note, which late her noble suit in court did shun, whose rarest havings made the blossoms dote, for she was sought by spirits of richest coat but kept cold distance and did thence remove to spend her living in eternal love. These lines describe a virtuous and highly regarded woman, possibly a nun, who rejected worldly pursuits, including the advances of wealthy suitors. Instead, she chose to devote herself to a life of spiritual love and devotion, maintaining a detached and distant demeanor towards worldly temptations. But, oh my sweet, what labor isn't to leave? The thing we have not, mastering what not strives, paling the place which did no form receive, playing patient sports in unconstrained jives. She that her fame so to herself contrives, the scars of battle scapeth by the flight, and makes her absence valiant, not her might. This passage from a lover's complaint explores the paradox of longing for something one doesn't possess, and the struggle of letting go of that desire. It suggests that the subject is trying to maintain her reputation by avoiding conflict, symbolized by the scars of battle, instead choosing to be absent, which is portrayed as a form of bravery. The unconstrained gyves symbolize the self-imposed restrictions and patience she adopts in her pursuit of preserving her dignity and reputation. Oh, pardon me, in that my boast is true, the accident which brought me to her eye, Upon the moment did her force subdue, and now she would the caged cloister fly. Religious love put out religion's eye, not to be tempted would she be immured, and now to tempt all liberty procured. The speaker is expressing remorse for his arrogance in winning over a woman's affection, which he achieved unintentionally. The woman initially resistant to temptation and preferring a life of seclusion is now overwhelmed by her newfound affection and desires freedom to explore it. Ironically, this profound love, which is compared to religious devotion, has blinded her to her previous religious commitments and led her to seek liberty, even if it means succumbing to temptation. How mighty then you are, oh, hear me tell. The broken bosoms that to me belong have emptied all their fountains in my well. And mine I pour your ocean all among. I strong o'er them, and you o'er me being strong, must for your victory us all congest, as compound love to physic your cold breast. The speaker is expressing their overwhelming feelings of love and devotion, stating that all the love they've received from others has been poured into the person they're speaking to. They acknowledge the power this person holds over them, and suggests that this intense combined love might be able to warm the person's indifferent or unresponsive heart. The speaker also implies their own strength in being able to endure this love, but concedes that the person's dominance over them is even greater. My parts had power to charm a sacred nun, who disciplined, a, dieted in grace, believed her eyes when they to assail begun, all vows and consecrations giving place. O most potential love, vow, bond, nor space, in thee hath neither sting not nor confine, for thou art all, and all things else are thine. These lines convey the speaker's reflection on their past allure, powerful enough to tempt even a devout nun. The speaker highlights the nun's religious discipline and devotion, which was ultimately overpowered by physical attraction. 
The last lines express the speaker's belief in the boundless power of love, which transcends all vows, bonds, and limitations, asserting that love is all-encompassing and everything else belongs to it. When thou impressest what are precepts worth of stale example, when thou wilt inflame how coldly those impediments stand forth of wealth, of filial fear, law, kindred, fame. Love's arms are peace gainst rule, gainst sense, gainst shame, and sweetens in the suffering pangs it bears, the aloes of all forces, shocks, and fears. This passage speaks to the overpowering nature of love. It suggests that when love takes hold, it makes all societal norms and obstacles like wealth, fear of parental disapproval, law, family, and reputation seem insignificant. Love, in its essence, is described as a peaceful rebellion against rules, common sense, and shame, and it has the power to sweeten even the most bitter experiences of life, such as force, shocks, and fears. Now all these hearts that do on mine depend, feeling it break, with bleeding groans they pine, and supplicant their sighs to you extend, to leave the battery that you make gainst mine, lending soft audience to my sweet design and credent soul to that strong bonded oath that shall prefer and undertake my troth. The speaker is expressing the deep emotional pain they're experiencing due to unrequited love. They're pleading with the person they love to stop causing them such heartache, hoping they'll listen to their heartfelt promises and intentions. The hearts that do on mine depend could signify the speaker's own emotions or others who are affected by their distress. This said, his watery eyes he did dismount, whose sights till then were leveled on my face, each cheek a river running from a fount, with brinish current downward flowed apace. Oh, how the channel to the stream gave grace, who glazed with crystal gate the glowing roses, that flame through water which their hue encloses. This describes a lover who is so overwhelmed with emotion that he begins to cry, his tears flowing like rivers down his cheeks. The crystal gate is a metaphor for his tear-filled eyes, through which his passionate love, symbolized by glowing roses, shines brightly. Despite his sorrow, there is a certain beauty in his emotional display, as the tears, the channel, enhance rather than diminish the intensity of his feelings, the stream. O oh, Father, what a hell of witchcraft lies in the small orb of one particular tear, but with the inundation of the eyes, what rocky heart to water will not wear? What breast so cold that is not warmed here? O oh, cleft effect, cold modesty, hot wrath, both fire from hence and chill extincture hath. Shakespeare is exploring the powerful emotional impact of a single tear, likening it to a form of witchcraft, capable of melting even the hardest of hearts. He further contrasts the effects of this tear, suggesting it can both ignite passionate anger, hot wrath, and extinguish it, chill extincture, demonstrating the complex and transformative nature of human emotions. For lo, his passion, but an art of craft, even there resolved my reason into tears. There my white stole of chastity I daft, shook off my sober guards and civil fears, appear to him as he to me appears, all melting, though our drops this difference bore, his poisoned me, and mine did him restore. The speaker is expressing her vulnerability and emotional surrender to her lover. She describes how her lover's apparent passion manipulated her into shedding her purity, represented by the white stole of chastity, and abandoning her rationality and societal inhibitions. However, she notes a tragic irony in their shared emotional intensity. While her love revitalizes him, his love is akin to poison, causing her harm. In him a plenitude of subtle matter, Applied to coddles, all strange forms receives, of burning blushes or of weeping water, or swooning paleness. And he takes and leaves, in either's aptness as it best deceives, to blush at speeches rank to weep at woes, or to turn white and swoon at tragic shows. The lines depict a lover who is incredibly adaptable and skilled at deception, able to display a wide range of emotions, from blushing to weeping, to appear pale or faint, depending on the situation. These emotional displays are not genuine, but are carefully crafted responses to manipulate others, whether it be to feign embarrassment at inappropriate remarks, to show sorrow at sad events, 
or to exhibit shock at tragic occurrences. That not a heart which in his level came could scape the hail of his all-hurting aim, showing fair nature is both kind and tame, and veiled in them did win whom he would maim. Against the thing he sought he would exclaim, when he most burned in heart-wished luxury, he preached pure maid and praised cold chastity. These lines describe a man who is so alluring and persuasive that no one can escape his charm. Despite his destructive tendencies, he is able to lure people in by showing a kind and gentle side. Interestingly, he preaches about purity and praises chastity, even though his deepest desires are driven by passion and lust. Thus merely with the garment of a grace, the naked and concealed fiend he covered, that the unexperienced gave the tempter place, which like a cherubin above them hovered, who young and simple would not be so lovered. A me I fell, and yet do question make, what I should do again for such a sake. The speaker is lamenting how they were deceived by a seemingly virtuous person who turned out to be a manipulator. The speaker, being naive and inexperienced, was easily seduced by this person. Despite the pain caused by this deception, the speaker is still unsure if they would avoid such a situation in the future, suggesting their struggle with the allure of love and desire. Oh, that infected moisture of his eye! Oh, that false fire which in his cheek so glowed! Oh, that forced thunder from his heart did fly! Oh, that sad breath his spongy lungs bestowed! Oh, all that borrowed motion seeming owed would yet again betray the four betrayed! and new pervert a reconciled maid. This excerpt speaks of the speaker's regret and sorrow over being deceived by a lover. The speaker is lamenting the lover's captivating yet deceitful appearance, infected moisture of his eye, false fire in his cheek, and expressions of passion, forced thunder from his heart, sad breath his spongy lungs bestowed. The final lines reveal the fear that this lover could once again deceive betray the four betrayed, and lead astray, new pervert, a woman who has already been hurt and reconciled herself to the pain.